Hello, my name is Jonathan Dixon, and thank you for watching this video about my newly published article in Synthes entitled No Hope for Conciliationism. So the background of this article involves this view in the peer disagreement literature called conciliationism. This is the family of views that says that when you recognize that you disagree with an epistemic peer about some of your beliefs P, you should suspend belief about P or significantly reduce your confidence or credence in P. So this view is often illustrated with intuitive examples like you and a friend go out to a restaurant and are going to evenly split the bill with 20% tip. You both independently calculate what you believe to be the correct split bill amounts. Both of you are about as evenly um, um, able to calculate the, the correct split bill amount. Um, neither of you is impaired anyway, and both of you are honestly attempting to calculate the split bill amount. You all have information about uh, how much the total bill is. You're just trying to figure out how much to split the bill with 20% tip. And while you both have a really reliable track record of doing this elementary math on this occasion, you disagree. One of you comes to some amount, another comes to you to a different amount. And conciliationism says that in cases like this, that you should suspend belief about your um, amount that you came to, and so should your epistemic peer. On, uh, on pain of irrationality, it would be um, irrational for you to maintain your belief or your same uh, confidence level or credence level in your split bill amount. So while this view is uh, highly intuitively plausible, uh, given cases like this, it faces this notorious self-undermining challenge. And this undermining challenge comes from people who are philosophical peers in the peer disagreement literature who disagree about the truth of conciliationism. So this problem uh, shows that by conciliationism own lights, they have to, or proponents of conciliationism, have to suspend belief about or significantly reduce their confidence about conciliationism itself. So that's the background of this paper. The thesis of the paper tries to show that responses to this challenge can be put into two mutually exclusive and exhaustive groups to be explained below. I argue that by CV's own lights, both kinds of responses almost certainly fail to save CV from the self-undermining challenge, and therefore CV is almost certainly permanently self-undermining. And this is significant because this result demonstrates that CV or conciliationism is almost certainly hopeless. There's almost certainly nothing that can save CV from this challenge. And I further argue that conciliationism, like any view, should be abandoned if it's almost certainly hopeless. So here, let's clarify the challenge before we get into the nitty gritty details of my argument. And I should say that I'm going to present the most streamlined version I can of the arguments in my paper. Many of the details um, will be left out, but you can always read the paper open access and synthesis for those details. So clarifying the challenge, the self-undermining challenge can be put into these, these premises. If acknowledged peers recognize they disagree on P, then peers should suspend belief on P. And the empirical premise says that acknowledged peers recognize that they disagree upon CV itself. So therefore, by conciliationism's own reasoning, peers should suspend belief on CV. So if sound, it seems like this challenge itself would show that proponents of CV are irrational if they remain proponents of CV or believe this view is adequately justified. And counterintuitively, CV would not be adequately justified, but would seem to be compelling considerations in its favor. So the split bill case. So as long as there is peer disagreement about CV itself, CV is an irrational thing to believe in or put much confidence in, according to CV itself. So as I mentioned, I think that there are two mutually exclusive and exhaustive ways of responding to the self-undermining challenge. They are the solution responses, which deny that CV is self-undermining and attempt to provide arguments which demonstrate this, and the skeptical responses, which attempt to show that CV, um, or sorry, accept that CV is self-undermining, but attempt to mitigate this result by arguing that this is either impermanent and or not very worrisome. And to just briefly spell out the main overarching argumentative move I make in this paper is essentially that 
there are going to be peer disagreements about either way of trying to respond to the self-undermining challenge. So by conciliationism's own lights, neither way of responding to the self-undermining challenge is going to be successful. And given that this kind of peer disagreement is going to be a perennial feature of of this debate, like most philosophical debates are, it seems that conciliationism will be permanently self-undermining. And as I go on to argue, if something is permanently self-undermining in this way, it's going to be hopeless and therefore it sh should um, be abandoned. So to continue on, uh, the solution responses, um, the main problem with solution responses is that they almost certainly are going to contain reasoning or auxiliary premises that are or will be disagreed upon by epistemic peers. And so consequently, CV dictates that epistemic peers should suspend belief on this reasoning or premises. And consequently, any solution response is going to fail to save CV from the self-undermining challenge. So let's get some examples. Elga has famously argued that CV is self-exempting because all fundamental principles, like conciliationism itself, have to be self-exempting in order to be consistent. And by the argument that I'm making in this paper, I say that this fails because the literature on Elga's argument is full of peers, including conciliationists themselves, who contest the soundness of Elga's argument. Bogardus is another person who argues for a kind of solution response, and he argues that the equal weight view, EWV, or it's a kind of conciliatory view, is not self-undermining since we can see via direct acquaintance that the equate view is obviously true. And in line with my argument, this fails because many deny that the equal weight view is obviously true or can be known through direct acquaintance. So this peer disagreement shows that this solution response is a failure to save conciliationism from the self-undermining challenge. And one thing I have to mention off the bat is that it seems like all solution responses are all going to be disagreed upon by proponents of steadfastness, a rival to conciliationism. And steadfastness is the family of views that says that it is rationally permissible in at least some, if not all, cases of peer disagreement to retain one's level of confidence or belief. So when it comes to steadfastness, as long as there are steadfasters out there, it seems like any sort of way of providing a solution response to the self-undermining challenge is going to be a failure in rescuing CV from this challenge. So moving on to the skeptical responses, I argue that the problem with skeptical responses is, again, the same kind of problem as before. There will almost certainly be disagreement among epistemic peers about whether skeptical responses adequately mitigate the self-undermining challenge for, or for um, CV. Consequently, CV dictates that epistemic peers should suspend belief on such skeptical responses. So let's get some examples. Christensen and Matheson, among others, like Kornbluth, have argued that while CV is indeed self-undermining, this does not show that CV is false. At best, what the self-undermining challenge shows is that CV cannot be currently justifiably believed or known to be true, but this is just a temporary problem for CV. Hopefully, philosophers in the future, according to conciliationists, will see the light and see that it is the correct view, and then the self-undermining problem dissolves. The empirical premise of the challenge is no longer true. But I argue that, at best, this should only provide cold comfort to conciliationists for three related reasons. First, given the fact that philosophers rarely reach consensus on or resolve their disagreements on substantive philosophical propositions, and second, the amount of peer disagreement regarding various solution responses just summarized above, it is likely that CV by its own lights will perennially remain epistemically self-undermining per the solution responses almost certainly fail argument I just presented above. And third, as already mentioned, steadfasters believe that CV is false and so a four to your eye, they do not believe that there will ever be agreement that CV is the true theory of peer disagreement as such by conciliatory reasoning, this peer disagreement between proponents of CV and steadfasters also defeats the claim that this is only a temporary problem for CV. So I think that these three kinds of peer disagreement seem to provide excellent support for the claim that by CV's own lights, proponents of CV will never justify believe, believe CV and that believing CV will be permanently unjustified and irrational. 
and transition, it's tempting to say that we can then make the um, significant argument that I want to make in this paper is that this gives us really good reason to just abandon CV. And it seems like we would do so using something like the following principle I call unjustified theory. If a subject S is not justified in believing or would not be justified believing a theory, then S is rationally required to give up, not be committed to, that theory. And since it seems like CV is going to be permanently self-undermining and it can't be believed, then it seems we're rationally required to not be committed to or give up that theory. However, there's a really interesting and recent uh, skeptical response involving a different kind of dog doxastic state from belief using endorsement. So what's the difference between beliefs and endorsement? To believe some proposition P requires that one to think P is true or likely true, but to endorse P does not require one think that P is true or likely to be true. Instead, endorsement is just a provisional doxastic attitude that one can take toward a theory that wasn't one is inclined to accept, but one can't yet believe. So endorsement provides a kind of skeptical response that the conciliationists can appeal to, and this is pursued by Will Fleischer in a paper of his from 2021. And he argues that you, or conciliations, do not have to abandon CV just because there's peer disagreement about it. Instead, they can, conciliations can endorse CV, and this would buy them time to rationally pursue the theory despite disagreement about it, so that hopefully a new consensus might emerge via new arguments and evidence for CV. And so contra unjustified theory, the principle we just mentioned, it does not follow that we should give up or abandon CV just because it is currently self-undermining. And one thing you might think is that is an endorsement a kind of, as a, as a skeptical response to the self-undermining challenge, kind of like ad hoc? And Fleischer provides compelling reasons to think, well, no, it's not ad hoc because endorsement is an independently motivated um, dosastic state and it's independently motivated by reflecting upon the rationality of inquiry, especially scientific inquiry. So for example, if one just happens to be working in a cutting edge field where there is little to no consensus, or if one reflects on the fact that the majority of proposed scientific theories have turned out to be false via the pessimistic meta induction or the problem of unconceived alternatives, et cetera, to many, it seems irrational to believe or to put much confidence in the theory one is researching is true. But continuing on this endorsement kind of skeptical response, it seems inappropriate to hold that scientists are irrational for continuing to research theories they cannot currently believe. Endorsement captures the intuitive thought that one should not abandon a scientific theory just because it is controversial or likely false. And it seems that the overall health of scientific inquiry would be harmed if scientists were required to give up or no longer pursue theories that they cannot rationally believe which is just contra unjustified theories. So this endorsement kind of skeptical response works in the following kind of way. We can endorse CV in the meantime um, in the same way that scientists can endorse theories that they cannot currently believe, but that's independently well motivated. So I argue in response to this skeptical response via the doxastic state of endorsement is that it's still that the three kinds of peer disagreement that I mentioned previously towards um, all um, solution responses still apply to the endorsement kind of skeptical response. That one, philosophical consensuses are rarely, if ever, reached. And the amount of peer disagreement regarding various solution responses summarized in section two above makes it likely that CV, by its own lights, will perennially remain epistemically self-undermining. So what we really need is a good solution response to the self-undermining challenge. And it seems like one of those is very unlikely to happen given the amount of peer disagreement in that literature already. And especially because three, steadfasters just believe that CV is false. And as such, they will likely believe that we should not endorse CV, full stop. But more importantly, I don't want to rest my argument against all skeptical responses just on those three kinds of um, general um, features of philosophical um, inquiry and disagreement, because it seems like, well, sorry, 
there are <laughs> philosophical peers in the literature on what dosastic attitude it is rational to take towards one's favorite theory who directly contest the rationality of endorsing CV or contest the truth of endorsement as a norm of inquiry. So to get back to my overall theme in this paper, this peer disagreement is going to show that this endorsement kind of skeptical response fails by CV's own lights to save it from the self-undermining problem. So here are the examples of those peer disagreements. So we have Bookock and Jackson argue that in the face of peer disagreement, it can be rational to remain committed to believing in one's favorite theory while reducing one's credence in this theory. So this is in direct disagreement with endorsement, which says that when it comes to CV, um, it is not rational to remain committed to believing CV, but one can still endorse it. So Jackson, and specifically, um, may, uses this distinction as a solution response to the self-undermining challenge. So she argues that in cases of peer disagreement about CV, it can be rational to steadfastly believe CV while being conciliatory in one's credence towards CV. In particular, she holds that it can be rational to believe CV even while having a middling to low credence in CV. So she holds a view that is in perfect disagreement with Fleischer's view uh, regarding endorsement as a kind of skeptical response. So thus, because there is existent peer disagreement on the appropriate epistemic attitude to have towards CV, Fleischer's endorsement skeptical response is undermined by the very view it is attempting to defend. And lastly, I claim that Skeptical responses almost certainly fail, this argument I'm pushing, will likely undermine any other kind of skeptical response that is proposed. So at this point, you might be having lots of objections uh, to my overall kind of argument or coming up with your own kind of solution response or skeptical response. In the paper, I provide lots of responses to possible objections. Uh, for concision, I'm going to skip over my responses to possible objections in this video. In the last part of the paper, I wrap it all up by saying that all peer disagreement mentioned above seems to show that there is ample peer disagreement in philosophy for CV to apply to and defeat any way of responding to the self-undermining challenge. And so this is a serious problem for proponents in conciliation because if my arguments are sound, then proponents in CV almost certainly can say nothing to defend their view from the self-undermining challenge since any defense offered will likely have some feature that will be disagreed upon by epistemic peers. And, I argue, one can almost certainly never rationally believe nor endorse CV since the reasons for taking these attitudes towards CV are likely to be disagreed upon by epistemic peers. Just like I mentioned before, there are um, the peer, peer disagreements between for example, Fleischer and Bookock and Jackson on this very issue. So where does this leave conciliationism? I argue that, uh, again, any um, um, way of responding to this problem is going to be um, a problematic thing for CV to respond to. And I want to say, again, that we can make the tempting argument that one should just give up or abandon a view that leads to these results, but we need to return to something that was mentioned before, um, this kind of argument that is tempting to make seems to conflict with the principle above with unjustified theory and Fleischer's compelling points that one should not abandon a theory just because it's controversial or likely false. Remember, uh, it doesn't seem right to say that scientists are irrational for pursuing or endorsing a scientific theory that they cannot currently believe. So why can't philosophers do that when it comes to conciliationism? It is a kind of cutting edge view, presumably after all. And my argument for abandoning CV is one that does not rely upon that principle unjustified theory. Instead, my argument for abandoning CV relies on the following more stringent principle, which I call perpetually unjustified theory. If subject S is not justified in believing or would not be justified in believing a theory, and S is justified in believing that they will almost certainly not be justified in believing a theory in perpetuity, then S is rationally required to give up or disbelieve that theory. So perpetually unjustified theory is very much like unjustified theory, that previous principle, except for it has this added 
italicized um, clause in it that an S is justified in believing that they will almost certainly not be justified in believing a theory of perpetuity. And it seems like that condition is satisfied when it comes to conciliationism. That's what my arguments in this paper seem to show that any way of trying to respond to the uh, self undermining challenge is likely going to be disagreed upon by epistemic peers. And so we are justified right now in believing that um, there will not be a um, justified way of responding to the self undermining challenge. And so it uh, conciliationism will likely or almost certainly be just um, uh, we are justified in believing that conciliationism will almost certainly not be justified in perpetuity. And so we're rationally required to give up or disbelieve that theory. And I argue that this shows that there's just no hope for CV or conciliationism. By CV's own lights, CV is almost certainly hopeless. In other words, there's almost certainly nothing that one can uh, that can save CV from the self-undermining challenge. And it's easy to see why this sort of um, no hope for conciliationism happens because it seems that like conciliationism conjoined with any reasons to mitigate or save CV from the self undermining challenge is very likely going to fail because CV itself undercuts any of the potential ways to defend CV from the self undermining challenge. And I argue that CV should be abandoned because it is almost certainly hopeless. So thank you for um, watching this video and I hope you enjoy my paper. Please reach out to me if you have any questions or um, want to discuss this further. Thank you again.